So today, I am beginning a four-week sermon series um, on the theme of stewardship. It's that time in the church when we think about stewardship and the coming year. The folks from various committees are coming to you and telling you about the work of what the work of their committees so that you'll understand more about how our church operates. This stewardship series I'm calling In God We Trust. Get it? That's on our money. There we go. But it's going to ask the question, do we really trust God? How much do we trust God? And so to explore this idea of trust in God, I want to look at the parables that are found in the entirety of Luke chapter 15. Because in Luke chapter 15, we find three parables, which we call the parables of the lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Lost son is also known as, yeah, the prodigal son. We share, you go, sure, that's three. I thought you were going to preach for four weeks. Well, there are two sons in that story, and they are both equally lost. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about stewardship and trust and lost and found. And our first reading today is that first wonderful parable about the lost sheep. And it's introduced to us with the information that tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. Now, who are tax collectors? Well, tax collectors were not looked upon very favorably in that day. Tax collectors worked for the Romans. They were viewed as Roman collaborators and corrupt at that. Uh, Roman uh, tax collectors were usually were, 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 uh, not hired by the Romans, but they sort of bought a franchise to collect taxes, and the person who owned the franchise was called the chief tax collector. And we meet one of these in Scripture in the form of Zacchaeus a little later on. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, and under him he has his subordinates. And Zacchaeus is paid a fee to the Romans in order to be chief tax collector, and it was mostly a toll tax, so Zacchaeus and his people would station themselves on the roads, and if a farmer, for example, was going to market with his goods, he would have to stop and pay a tax. And as I said, these people weren't viewed very favorably because they were viewed as collaborating with the Romans, and also they probably overcharged because then they could keep the extra for themselves. So these tax collectors were not viewed favorably, to say the least, and they were pushed out of polite society. Um, If a tax collector wanted to attend worship at the synagogue, they probably wouldn't be allowed. The priest or the rabbi would go, we don't want your type here. You're a sinner. And then, in fact, there are the sinners. That's that other catch-all phrase. And Luke's probably a little harsher on the idea of sinner than we are. We feel that we're all sinners. Luke would probably agree. But these sinners are those who've done something probably a little more reprehensible than just being a sinner. And they have, by their actions, been pushed to the fringes of polite society. And even if they wanted to come back, they wouldn't be allowed back. So that's one group. The other group are the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, we know about the Pharisees. They're a Jewish sect known for their strict adherence to the Torah as well as the oral tradition They emphasize ritual purity and prayer and tithing even, which makes them a favorite of mine this time of year. The Pharisees were particularly concerned with maintaining the purity of the religious people and their traditions. Pharisees were not bad people. Pharisees were those who were probably viewed themselves as closest to God because everything they did was an attempt to follow the word of God as they interpreted it. And interpreting the word of God is tough. And so in order to do this, they had built up layer after layer of tradition and laws and and responsibilities that were nearly impossible for the average person to follow. So 
in the face of a Pharisee, we're all sort of sinners because we can't do all the things that they've set out for us. The scribes worked alongside with the Pharisees interpreting the law to the people. And these two groups look at Jesus and they see him hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And they grumbled about it. They weren't happy because this Jesus person who claimed to be a man of God, who claimed to be a rabbi and a teacher, is hanging out with people that he shouldn't be hanging out with. But we know that Jesus did this because Luke tells us in different places that he ate a meal with the tax collector Levi as well as Zacchaeus. Uh, Jesus is walking through town and Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus and Jesus recognizes him and says, Zacchaeus, take me to your home and let us eat there. And that changed Zacchaeus' life. He vowed then to reform and to pay back people that he had stolen from. Then there's the issue of a sinner. Uh, there's the person, we don't know her name, but she's just called the sinful woman. Jesus this time has been invited to a meal at the home of a Pharisee, and this woman sort of crashes the party, and everybody knows that, well, she shouldn't be there. They know her reputation. But what is she doing? She comes in and drops to Jesus' feet and begins to anoint his feet with his expensive oil and then wipes his feet with her hair and kisses her feet and spreads her tears on him. And the Pharisees sort of appalled, thinking Jesus should not be involved with this woman at all. He should send her away. And Jesus knows what the Pharisee is thinking and says, Since I came into this house, this woman has showed more love to me than you have. I welcome her. Jesus welcomed the sinners. He didn't turn them away. He didn't turn them down. He welcomed them. And that was enough. And so when he was available, they would come to him to listen to his teachings, to be in his presence, to be in the presence of someone religious when others had turned them away. So, in this scenario, Jesus is aware of this tension between the Pharisees and the scribes, and so he tells the parable, the parable of the lost sheep, a wonderful parable. And he asks a question of the Pharisees. He says, which one of you, which one of you, if you've got a hundred sheep, and you lose one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that one that's lost until you find it. And the three most important words in that verse are in the wilderness. Jesus says, would you not leave the 99 in the wilderness? It's not, as we would assume, when you leave them at home, in their pasture, in their paddock, in the barn, in someplace safe. No. Would you leave them in the wilderness? And the Judean wilderness is a rugged, dangerous place. It exists just outside of Jerusalem. I've been there. It's full of steep gullies and ravines, um, cliffs, uh, caves. I mean, it's a dangerous place to be. And if you've got your sheep out there grazing, I mean, one could go 20 yards and disappear. And that appears to have happened here in this parable. That a sheep has been lost. And Jesus asked, what do you do then? Parables are wonderful things. They're stories told by Jesus, but they're much more than stories. They're, they're also very slippery. They're hard to describe. There are lots of ways authors have attempted to describe parables, and mainly they end up saying, well, you know one when you see it. But I did find a wonderful description this week in my readings, and this writer said that parables begin with the world we know and end in a world that is drawing upon us. They start in this world, but they end in a different world, and we know that that different world is the kingdom of God. So a parable starts with us, but ends in the kingdom. And that's what's happening here. We start off with this shepherd, generic 
Pharisee shepherd who loses a sheep. And Jesus asks the question, which one of you wouldn't go after that sheep? And leave the other 99 there in the wilderness and go after the one to find it and not give up until you've found it. But you're leaving the 99 in danger because they could wander off. They could fall into a gully. They could be attacked by wild animals. We are in this season of stewardship, and stewardship, as we understand it, is caring for God's resources. As stewards, we've been entrusted with the resources of God, both our time and our talents. And we are expected as stewards to manage all these resources responsibly. So the season of stewardship is not just giving our own money, pledging our own money but it is also responsibly managing this money that we've been given to use it in the best way possible for the purpose of God on this earth, which, as I said, is one of the reasons we're having our committees come and share with you what our church is doing down at the nitty-gritty level. So in this parable, we have the shepherd, we have the sheep, the lost sheep, but he finds the sheep. And that's when things get a little different, because what does he do? He rejoices, puts the sheep on his shoulder, carries it back to the rest, rejoices. When he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbors and invites them to rejoice with him, because what was lost has now been found. And that's where things get a little different, because a shepherd really shouldn't be rejoicing over one lost sheep. I mean, he shouldn't have lost the sheep in the first place. His job, his solely job, is to watch the sheep. And to invite friends and neighbors in to celebrate because they found the sheep, well, again, he's just celebrating because he's done his job. But things are different in this world. Things are different in the world of the parable. So a question to ask at this point in time is, who lost the sheep? Was it the shepherd slash Pharisee? Or did God lose the sheep? Or was the sheep already lost? And if so, why does God go after that particular sheep? Because, as I've discussed, it's very poor economic judgment on God's part. It's a very low return on investment when you've got the other sheep in critical danger. But we, because we're the sheep, we're made in God's image, aren't we? We are told that at the very beginning. We are made in the image of God. Even the sinners are made in the image of God. And so to lose one of us, to lose one of the children of God, is to lose a part of God. And God loves us that God will drop everything to come after us. And that is the promise of great joy, that God seeks out the lost. And so that raises the question, why should we trust God? If we say in God we trust, why should we trust God? We can trust God because we have this understanding that no matter what happens to us, no matter how far we stray, that God will come after us, that God loves us, that God claims us as God's own. And that's just a remarkable level of reassurance that we can't find anywhere else in our lives, that God seeks the lost and does not give up until the lost are found and then rejoices, rejoices over what has been found. And so as we talk about trust over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to ask this question, do we trust God with our money? Do we trust God with our time? and our talent. I mean, God will come after us, but is it enough for us to give of ourselves to God? And while we're talking about being lost and consequently being saved, it's a good time to remember Jesus' words that those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for, the, for his sake will save it. So while we're being saved, we're also reminded that we need to lose 
that part of ourselves which is keeping us from the kingdom. We have to give up that sinful part of ourselves so that God may save us. Are we to be like the Pharisees who snubbed the sinners? Are we going to choose to be like Christ who welcomed them? And remember, even on the cross, Jesus was there praying for the forgiveness of his ex executioners and blessing even the thief hanging next to him. Even on the cross, Jesus was welcoming. Today is World Communion Sunday, and as is our tradition, we celebrated communion together, um, early service and late service together, in a wonderful breakfast there, followed by communion. We had a meal together. And if there's something to note about each of these three parables, they end in rejoicing, but by rejoicing, they really mean a meal. We'll see that more next week, and especially in the story of the prodigal son, where they slay the fatted calf and have a party. So to have communion together is right in line with these parables of the lost, because when the lost are found, we celebrate. And that's what we do in communion, to celebrate our oneness with God and our oneness with one another. God is a God who rejoices when the lost are found. Our God is not some faceless tyrant who demands subservience and demands that we follow his every whim and command. But our God is a God who actively seeks restoration. And as the scriptures describe God, we are reminded that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God is a God that we can trust. Amen.